Hello. Uh, so, uh, first question: English or Polish? Polski. No, to super. Uh, jeżeli ktoś, uh, if anybody needs English, then please raise your hand. Okay. So, English it is. Uh, okay. So, goddamn. Uh, okay, so today we are going to talk about um, Kubernetes and how to make uh, DevOps with the usage of this um, tool. So um, basically everything will be um, shown using a live uh, demo. Uh, we will, uh, of course, cover only um, basic uh, concepts, but frankly speaking, uh, they will be enough uh, to go uh, to the pre-production with it, since it will uh, cover uh, most of your uh, daily basis um, uh, scenarios. And at the end, we will summarize, of course, uh, DevOps uh, topics. Uh, I'm going to show you also uh, how you can go with the Kubernetes in different uh, clouds. And at the end, a few words uh, regarding uh, pros and uh, cons. Uh, because, like every technology, uh, Kubernetes um, uh, has also uh, some uh, drawbacks, so you have to be aware uh, when uh, to, to use it. So, um, basically, what's a Kubernetes? Uh, Kubernetes is yet another cluster uh, orchestration um, engine, but uh, basically, um, so what? Um, before going any further, I would like to um, focus on our goals and aims, since uh, before usage of any tool, we should uh, know why we want to use it and how it will help us uh, at the end, right? Um, so, um, from the developer perspective, it's all about microservices or uh, nanoservices, if we are talking about um, serverless uh, architecture, so that uh, doesn't uh, matter. So. The concept is uh, quite uh, obvious and uh, well um, known, but not everybody uh, understands that uh, microservices must go with the proper uh, support of the uh, organization. Because if you have uh, 1,000 uh, services that are working in your infrastructure, that basically means that you have to have very um, powerful and mature uh, solution for logging, monitoring, and uh, health checks. Uh, because uh, without uh, those two things, uh, basically, you are blind, so you are not able to manage your infrastructure. If we have uh, so many um, services uh, in our uh, cluster, then obviously we want to have everything uh, automated. Uh, therefore, we have also continuous um, delivery. And last but not least, uh, isolation. And by isolation, I mean here isolation of the code. So basically, every uh, microservice should be um, placed in different uh, repository. But those uh, data goes even uh, farther. We should uh, think also about uh, isolating uh, build management processes, uh, deployment processes, and uh, resources that at the end are attached and uh, assigned to our uh, services uh, in the cluster because um, this is very important. Uh, and the good thing is that uh, Kubernetes uh, simplifies all of, the, uh, all of, of those um, uh, things. Um, so therefore, this is a uh, so, uh, handy um, tool. OK, so now having uh, those uh, topics in mind, we can start uh, talking about uh, the cubes. So basically, the most important uh, features of uh, Kubernetes is a very easy and uh, declarative way of making um, deployments. Uh, because of very uh, simple way of making uh, deployments, uh, Kubernetes also give us uh, out-of-the-box uh, scaling and uh, load uh, balancing. And we have also um, default uh, support for rolling uh, updates. So basically, that means that we will have uh, no uh, downtime or very um, short uh, downtime during making any changes in the uh, infrastructure. Um, so it, will, it should be uh, transparent to our uh, customers at the end. And if we have rolling updates, that basically means that we have also some um, procedure for um, fallback, so failure recovery. And as I mentioned uh, before, we have also some uh, basic approach for uh, logging and the monitoring. Uh, of course, this is not a um, solution uh, for production, right? Nevertheless, I believe it's a good start um, in order to begin your um, journey. 
and at the end, why Kubernetes? Because um, basically, Kubernetes is uh, cloud agnostic. So it means that you are independent on the cloud uh, provider. Uh, it can work in the GCP. It can work in AWS or whatever uh, you want. It can even stand on bare um, metal. So you have uh, total uh, freedom. And uh, this is non-monolithic solution. So it is also composed of uh, micro uh, services. Uh, so thanks to that, you have uh, total freedom, uh, and you can do with it what basically um, you want. So that's the whole point. OK, but I believe that it's enough of talking. So uh, let's go to the um, console, and let's uh, start play with the um, Kubernetes first. OK, so in order to access uh, Kubernetes, we have to have a context um, defined. So basically, um, Kubernetes and the cluster of it is a um, closed box. So in order to access it uh, via uh, master nodes, you have to have a secured uh, context, uh, which then proxies uh, the, the whole uh, traffic uh, to the uh, cluster in a proper uh, way. So uh, without this uh, context, you are not uh, able to reach it. As you can see, I have already um, context uh, defined for my uh, local uh, cluster of the uh, Kubernetes. We can use it and go to the um, dashboard. So this is how Kubernetes looks like in the practice, but uh, frankly speaking, you won't be visiting a dashboard uh, too often. Uh, in most of cases, you are just uh, displaying this, uh, this dashboard for uh, demo uh, presentations or for sales uh, purposes, uh, frankly speaking. Um, we have here a lot of uh, concepts, and most of them uh, will be uh, covered um, today. So let's uh, start perhaps with the nodes, because the um, structure of the cluster uh, is uh, the cornerstone for, for um, everything. So um, Kubernetes is composed of two types of uh, nodes. Uh, so basically, you have uh, masters, which are the brain of everything. Uh, masters are scheduling operations, are uh, keeping the state, uh, desired state of our um, uh, services. And we have uh, agent, war, uh, agent nodes, uh, which are workers. So basically, those are the nodes where our services will be uh, placed uh, at the end. Uh, OK. Um, so now, um, first thing that we want to do is to deploy our microservice to the uh, cluster, right? And in order to understand that, no, uh, don't be uh, afraid. In a moment, I will go to the uh, presentation mode. Uh, I have to open just the uh, first thing. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so uh, the first thing that you have to um, understand before making a deployment to the uh, Kubernetes is a pod. A uh, pod is basically just a container or a group of the uh, containers which are visible from the Kubernetes perspective as an atomic unit. Uh, so those containers always go um, uh, together. And uh, because of that, uh, they share the same uh, context. Uh, they have uh, the same IP in the cluster. They have the same range of uh, ports. And they have uh, the same uh, volumes uh, mounted, and they can re refer each other uh, via a local host. So uh, here is the sample how uh, declaration of the pod looks like uh, in the um, uh, practice. Um, so basically, uh, on production, you don't touch uh, pods, uh, so the instances, basically, of your services manually, since uh, pods can go, uh, can, can burn and go away whenever uh, Kubernetes uh, desires uh, to do so. Because uh, at some point of time, Kubernetes can uh, say that, OK, I see that the traffic and the load on one of the nodes is uh, too big. So because of that, I will remove some pods and move them to the other um, nodes in order to balance our um, traffic uh, at the uh, end. Um, so therefore, we are just creating this pod for um, demo purposes. So please uh, don't do this uh, on the production. So uh, here we have sample pod uh, that is uh, composed of uh, two containers. Uh, we have uh, one Debian container that will produce just a sample um, content that at the end will be um, uh, delivered by the second container, which is uh, engine um, X. Um, so 
Let's uh, create it. And basically, that's it. Uh, I will also uh, get the information about nodes, pods, deployments, so basically everything what we have inside of our um, cluster. So in a second, it should be um, there. So at the moment, yeah. OK, so now we have uh, our pod that is up and running. Uh, basically, uh, I mean here, um, Engine X. So we can now access it. We have to specify here that we want to access our Nginx uh, container. And let's uh, go uh, to the bash, right? Um, so let's now uh, hit our Nginx. Uh, one second. OK. Yeah, so it's working, right? Uh, second container has the access uh, to the content of the um, first circuit container in the whole group. OK, so now we know how um, Kubernetes is managing basically the instances of our services, right? So those are um, pods. So now uh, we can focus on making a deployment, so basically um, delivering our services uh, to the infrastructure. So that is done using um, deployment. Deployment is really just a um, description of the desired state of our um, service. So as you can see, we have here an um, image that should be um, deployed. And we have here a number of uh, replicas, so pods that uh, should be available uh, at the end. And we have here some uh, different information. We, can, uh, we have here, for instance, um, uh, limitation of the resources uh, that uh, should be uh, also attached uh, to, to our um, uh, service. Uh, we have some uh, volumes that can be uh, mounted. And we have uh, two types of uh, different uh, probes. And what's the um, difference uh, between um, them? Um, liveness uh, probe is basically a um, health check that is uh, saying whether um, deployment was uh, successful or um, uh, not. So uh, health check is uh, saying whether from generic uh, point of view our service is uh, working and is ready to be um, to, to handle some um, traffic. So if it, if it is not, then uh, Kubernetes will try to restart the pods in order to uh, reach a desired um, uh, state. Readiness uh, probe has a different uh, purpose. A readiness probe is uh, basically a very uh, simple uh, solution for a circuit uh, breaker. So let's say we have a peak uh, hours, right? And uh, we have too many HTTP requests that are uh, uh, going to our instances of our uh, web server or web service, uh, whatever. So uh, in that case, we don't want to push our instance uh, too far in order to not uh, crash it, right? So uh, if readiness probe uh, in such a situation will uh, return a failure uh, state, then Kubernetes automatically will um, take this instance out of uh, load balancer. It will give it uh, some time in order to restore and uh, handle all the ongoing um, traffic an ongoing uh, HTTP request, uh, let's say. And if it's OK, then it will uh, put it back into the load uh, balancer whenever the, this readiness probe will return uh, OK uh, status. Uh, so thanks to that, we have a greater uh, stability of our um, service. So now let's check how this looks like uh, also in the real uh, world. So we will deploy basically um, everything. And in a second, it should be up and running. So we are checking this state, and we are waiting till it's ready. OK, so we have, uh, we have our now uh, two um, instances. We can check uh, the address of it, and we can reach it uh, also Mm. 
yeah. So as you can see, our service is up and running. And let's say now uh, I will show you what kind of microservice we have here. This is a very uh, simple one, which is uh, basically doing uh, two things. It is returning um, properties uh, from uh, config uh, stuff. We will get to um, that part. And it is uh, keeping the uh, health check that is uh, returned uh, to the probes uh, for the, uh, sorry, uh, Kubernetes. And uh, with the post request, we can uh, change this uh, health check uh, status in order to see what Kubernetes will do with uh, such uh, instances. So let's now uh, change the um, health status of one of the instances. And in that case, we should see that one of these pods should, um, should be restarted. As you can see, uh, after um, some uh, time, uh, given a specified uh, specified um, here, Kubernetes has uh, detected that uh, one of the instances is uh, collapsed, and because of that, it has uh, restarted it. Okay, so now we know how to. Um, make uh, deployments. So let's, in that case, check how we can do rolling uh, updates. So I will uh, update the version of our uh, services, and I will place their image that will uh, fail. So, ba so basically, be uh, because of this uh, deployment, uh, we will have unsuccessful uh, deployment at the end. And uh, let's uh, see what the Kubernetes will do um, with that. OK, uh, as you can see, um, our service is still up and running. And Kubernetes has reduced uh, some of the pods. And it is creating uh, the new instances with the new uh, version. So whenever we are making a deployment with the Kubernetes, we can define the strategy how we want to do it uh, at the end. If we have very huge services that are um, composed of, uh, let's say, 100,000, uh, oh, okay, uh, so, so perhaps uh, too, too much, 1,000 uh, instances, then perhaps we don't want to keep 2,000 instances during um, deployment, right? So we can, for instance, uh, say that during a deployment, Kubernetes uh, should reduce instances by 50% of our uh, current uh, version of our uh, service and should uh, try to make a um, new um, deployment. And if it's successful, then it can uh, eliminate uh, the uh, old um, service, and it can deliver the, the new one with the uh, full uh, power, so with the desired um, state. As you can see, uh, this um, deployment was uh, unsuccessful. So we have here uh, restarts all the time, right? We, we have some uh, errors that we can uh, see here. So if we want to do now a uh, rolling update, we should just um, write one simple uh, command. We want to do rollout. And basically, that's it. Uh, Kubernetes now will restore the old version of our um, service, and we can cope with the issues that uh, we have. And please uh, keep in mind that our service was available uh, all the time, right? So, so there was uh, no um, downtime or very sh short one for, for the, our uh, end um, clients. Uh, OK, so how does it work uh, behind uh, the scene? Uh, OK. So whenever we are uh, making a new version of the uh, deployment, uh, Kubernetes is creating a middleman. So this middleman, it is called replica set or replica controller. So basically, there are two the same uh, things. Just replica set is the um, solution of the uh, next uh, generation. Nevertheless, replica uh, set is uh, responsible of keeping uh, pods uh, in our uh, desired um, uh, state. So uh, whenever Kubernetes uh, says that uh, deployment is successful, 
all it does is just uh, switching the version of the replica sets on the load balancer, right? So thanks to that, this operation is very um, quick. It takes a few milliseconds or perhaps a nanoseconds to, to do that. And uh, we can uh, make uh, changes uh, transparently for, for our um, customers. And uh, the same things happen happens when we are making uh, rolling uh, when we are making a fallback uh, procedure, right? So in that case, uh, Kubernetes is just taking the old version of our replica set. It is uh, plugging it into the uh, load balancer, and uh, everything is uh, get back to um, normal. And uh, in the pods, uh, in the deployments, uh, we can uh, say how many. Uh, versions we want to uh, keep in the uh, history. So basically, because of that, we can go back in time as far as we only um, want. Uh, all right, so now we know how to uh, make uh, updates of our services, how to make um, uh, fallbacks. So one reminding thing is uh, scaling uh, up and down, right? Um, so scaling can be also uh, be done using very simple um, command. And in that case, Kubernetes will uh, rescale our um, service to three instances. Uh, and basically, that's it. And also, how does it work uh, behind uh, the scene? So uh, auto-scaling. Uh, for the auto scanning is responsible the unit that is called horizontal pod uh, auto scaler. So this unit is reading all the metrics from the all the cluster that are that are available in the uh, hipster. Hipster is a central unit where all the metrics and uh, events from the cluster um, uh, uh, go. So basically, whenever we are creating the pod, there is some C advisor uh, unit that is gathering just the metrics and the uh, stuff related with this uh, pod. And it is forwarding it to the uh, hipster. And thanks to that, hipster uh, has all information in order to uh, make decisions about the auto scaling um, whatsoever. So whenever we want to add or remove uh, the instance uh, for from our um, service, we have to just update uh, meta information about the deployment. And after that, replica set will uh, want to um, achieve new desired uh, state that was uh, just um, applied. And thanks to that, those uh, pods will be added or removed uh, as we uh, want. And uh, let's also um, check how we can, for instance, do uh, the monitoring. OK, mm monitoring. So I will use here um, Datadog, since it has some default dashboard that is uh, defined for the uh, Kubernetes. Uh, OK, uh, one second. I will have to uh, do one thing first. But I forgot. Uh, firstly, I have to. Um, firstly, I have to get my key for Datadog. OK, and uh, let's uh, check how uh, monitoring and log aggregation can be uh, done uh, with the uh, Kubernetes. Uh, so here, the situation is very uh, simple. So uh, it always looks very uh, similar. So we are creating daemon set, which uh, allow us to create the, the single instance of the pod on every node in our machine. So thanks to that. Uh, we can forward all the informations from um, OS, so for from the node to the desired uh, place. And this is also how FluentD works with the Kubernetes, right? So if you want to do some log aggregation, you are doing it in very similar uh, fashion. So basically, you are defining just FluentD that will forward uh, your uh, logs uh, to the uh, desired uh, place. And basically, that's everything you have your log uh, aggregator. So um, now, if we will go to the um, dashboard of the 
Datadog. In a second, we will we should see here uh, traffic that will uh, appear in this um, place. So let's check it uh, in a uh, second. Uh, okay. So now we know how to make uh, basic uh, operations on our um, services. So one remaining uh, thing is uh, publishing, right? Because uh, at this moment, uh, at this moment, we don't have uh, our service visible yet. Uh, inside of the cluster or outside of the cluster uh, as um, well. In order to publish our um, service, we have to define service um, uh, instance, uh, which is a really um, logical set of our um, pods. So whenever we are creating a service in the Kubernetes, we have load balancer behind it. So whenever uh, we are referring to this uh, service, Kubernetes will um, dispatch the uh, traffic to uh, proper um, pods uh, that are uh, creating uh, this um, service. So service is also a point where you can uh, define, for instance, your SSL, uh, where you can define your uh, access policy, and where you can also uh, say whether this service should be visible uh, only from the uh, inside of the cluster, or it should be published uh, as the, with the external IP or whether it should be uh, published externally with some DNS uh, registration. And uh, service is also a mechanism that uh, allow us to do uh, service uh, discovery inside of the uh, cluster. So um, now we have service that is uh, called uh, Java sample, right? So if I will go now uh, to the... Um, pod that I have created at the beginning. Um, uh, then, of course, I can uh, reach uh, our service using uh, this URL. So, kind of obvious, right? Duh. But we can also uh, reach it using just uh, the name of it, right? Uh, sample um, Java, hello. Uh, okay, one second. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, okay, sorry, uh, thank you. So as you can see, we have uh, auto discovery also out of um, the box. And this is very important uh, from the testing and configuration management point of view, but, we'll, uh, but we will uh, get to that in a um, second. OK, so now we have almost everything regarding our uh, mi microservices and what we want to do uh, with it. So one remaining uh, point is uh, to have agnostic packages, right? Uh, since we want to, for instance, um, uh, make the propagation be between environments and uh, so on and uh, so, so on. So um, configuration in the Kubernetes is kept in uh, two places that are called uh, config map or uh, secrets. Uh, those are really just uh, key value stores uh, that are working uh, on the top of uh, etcd. Uh, the only difference uh, is between them uh, is about uh, the, the access um, rights. So config map uh, is uh, open uh, stuff that can be reached from inside of the cluster without any problems. And in order to uh, grab our um, secrets, uh, we have to mount it uh, using um, volumes. And uh, thanks to that, we can see those uh, properties um, inside of our um, service uh, at the end. Um, so why this is uh, important? This is also important because uh, thanks to the Kubernetes, all of your configuration between the environments will look very similar. So it, all, it will be all the same, or it will be similar in, let's say, 90%. Uh, percent. So um, this simplifies a lot the testing between, between the environments, and that gives you the guarantee that whenever you want to make a deployment to the production, you can be 
I'm sure that uh, it will uh, work how uh, it has been working in uh, previous uh, environments, and that's also the, the whole um, point. One cool feature of the Kubernetes is also um, having um, uh, is having uh, updates about the state of the cluster via um, event uh, bus. So whenever anything changes in the Kubernetes, we can be informed about it. So if we, uh, thanks to that, if we want, we can reload the um, status of our uh, services uh, transparently. So let's say that we have here this uh, configuration and we want to um, change it. So in a second, we should see here new um, information. I have uh, change it, yeah. One kiss, okay. Okay, so it doesn't work now, so, so no clue why. But uh, in that case, um, the culprit of it is um, Spring uh, plugin, which is responsible for, for um, that uh, feature. So in order to make such a, a reload of the um, configuration, we are applying the proper um, plugin from the Spring. And uh, it's just uh, taking uh, uh, the name of our service from the um, uh, jar file, and it is a looking config configuration map with the same um, name. So it was working before, so demo effect, um, sorry uh, for that. Okay. Um, so now we have uh, all uh, things uh, covered uh, for our micro uh, services. So uh, we know how to uh, publish those services at the end, uh, how to make basic operations on that. But there is one thing uh, more. Um, the drawback of the uh, service is uh, the fact that whenever we are creating service in our cluster, we are creating external uh, point of uh, access, which is uh, really a security concern. So because of that, we want to have um, single uh, entry point, and for that, uh, Ingress is uh, responsible uh, for. Um, so Ingress is uh, basically yet another uh, load balancer on the way, so this is yet another engine um, X. So thanks to that, uh, we can have one uh, access uh, point, and we can define a rule uh, which um, services should be reached uh, at the end. So that basically means that whenever uh, traffic is going to our cluster, we have uh, two um, hops, right? We have a first uh, hop on the um, ingress, and the second we have a hop on the nginx of our uh, service um, itself. Ingress is also important from the um, uh, from uh, from the for the second uh, from the second reason, and that's basically the federation of the um, clusters. So. If we have uh, different clusters uh, in different data centers in different uh, geo uh, locations, so because of ingress, we can manage all those uh, clusters as if we were uh, managing the single uh, cluster. So in that case, we are just uh, creating the special context in the Kubernetes, and we can um, make the all the uh, operations uh, between uh, those uh, uh, class uh, clusters uh, transparently. Yeah, so let's uh, summarize um, DevOps. So hopefully, based on this um, live demo, I have proved you that uh, DevOps can be done very in very easy way with the uh, Kubernetes. But there are a few other also very important uh, things and benefits that Kubernetes uh, gives you. Uh, first of all, uh, it helps you to eliminate the uh, scripts uh, which are written using, uh, for instance, tools like uh, Bash, Ansible, and uh, Chef. It also gives you great uh, standardization because uh, it's describing everything in very declarative way. This is very important from the organization uh, point of view. Whenever you are changing your project, uh, project 
First thing that you have to do is basically uh, check how DevOps are organized uh, there. With the Kubernetes, uh, basically that's, uh, that, that, that point goes uh, out. Uh, DevOps with the Kubernetes always uh, look in a similar um, way. And uh, last but not least, uh, not, last, uh, not least thing is that um, Kubernetes uh, makes all uh, operations in the, in the potent uh, way. Uh, Whenever you have Ansible and a Chef, and whenever you are making the new deployment, you have to take care of uh, cleaning uh, stuff in order to be sure that these old uh, things won't um, pollute and won't affect your new um, deployment. Uh, thanks to the Kubernetes, you don't have to care about that because the old operations will be independent. And, uh, also, uh, what is very important for, for me, if you are a great uh, fan of uh, Vagrant or uh, Docker Compose, you can throw it out uh, because you can have a um, cluster of the Kubernetes also locally using uh, Minikube. So thanks to that, you have also easier uh, local um, development. And uh, now about uh, the, the, the clouds. Uh, the easiest uh, way uh, to start your journey with the Kubernetes is, of course, uh, GCP, so Google Cloud uh, part Platform. Um, no wonder, uh, since uh, Google has invented it. Uh, in the GCP, uh, you have auto-scaling uh, out of uh, the box. You have a transparent updates out of the box, which is very important because the Kubernetes is uh, changing very um, rapidly. So uh, if you have, for instance, uh, one month old uh, cluster, it can mean that, for instance, you are two versions uh, be be behind. Um, so, so therefore, the strong transparent uh, updates are really um, important. And uh, in GCP, you don't pay for uh, master um, the nodes because the GCP gives you that for um, free. Uh, in Azure, uh, thing is also very um, so simple. You can also create a cluster with just a single um, command. And uh, in order to do that, you have to just reach Azure Contain uh, Service, uh, which uh, allows you to use one of the three um, orchestration engines. So DCOS, Swarm, or uh, Kubernetes, uh, if you uh, like. The only drawback at the moment is that it doesn't support auto-scaling uh, yet, but Azure is um, developing very quickly. So I believe that, th that this is just uh, the matter of um, months. And last but not, uh, not least, uh, AWS. So here, thing is a little bit more um, complicated. In order to um, create a cluster of the Kubernetes there, you have to use um, COPS um, tool, uh, which uh, requires uh, a few more uh, steps. Nevertheless, this is uh, fairly um, uh, so simple. Uh, you have there also uh, uh, auto-scaling and um, auto-updates of the uh, version of all your uh, Kubernetes, so this is also a good uh, thing. One important uh, topic to mention is here that uh, Kubernetes is something different than uh, ECS, uh, so please remember that. ECS is just a solution for scaling uh, just pure uh, instances of the uh, dockers, so of the uh, instances, but using ECS, you will uh, have to take care of uh, other topics like, for instance, configuration, uh, management, uh, service discovery, and uh, so, so on. So that basically uh, means that whenever you're using ECS, you will most probably will have to use uh, tools like uh, console or whatever, right? So this is a great uh, difference between um, those um, two. And if you want to go pro, you can uh, use Kubernetes anywhere. This is a tool written using uh, Terraform, which can also deploy uh, Kubernetes to different uh, clouds. And of course, Kubernetes the hard way if you want to do everything manually uh, from um, so scratch. So uh, when to use it? Um, Basically, if you have a few micro services, so let's say two, three, or perhaps five, this is a matter of a judgment, then perhaps it's easier to do these uh, things just manually using a simple bash scripts and just uh, deploying your services to pure virtual machines. But if you have 10, 20, 30 microservices, then uh, definitely in such a case, Kubernetes is, uh, becomes uh, very um, handy. Kubernetes is also very uh, important if you want to have very high uh, resource utilization. So basically, whenever you don't want to pay for idle time, you can push your cluster uh, to the limits thanks to the Kubernetes because you can um, deploy there as many services as you basically uh, want. 
And uh, last but not least, uh, Kubernetes is very uh, great if your uh, different teams and projects want to work uh, in the same uh, infrastructure and then they want to cooperate um, to together. Uh, so let's say that you can even, uh, you can even have uh, different environments of your product on single cluster uh, because defining namespaces, you can put a limit on for each of these uh, environments. So you can say, for instance, that your development environment can take a max maximum 5% uh, of the cluster power, QA can take, uh, let's say, 20, and the rest is for the production. So with the Kubernetes, that's uh, not uh, a problem. And last uh, uh, but not least, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, it's independent from the cloud provider. So thanks to that, uh, you can migrate whenever uh, you, went, uh, you want. And you can have, thanks to that, also very uh, generic uh, solution and architecture. And this is also very important uh, at the end. Yeah, so that's basically everything what you should know about the Kubernetes before going live. So if you have any questions, then please Go with it. Any questions? Somebody wants to ask something? Oh, okay, we have one. Okay, uh, do you know a simple way to uh, convert ECS, like services, tasks, and task definitions to uh, Kubernetes services? Uh, so sorry, once again? Uh, is there a simple way to convert uh, from ECS to uh, Kubernetes? Why do you want to, want to switch, right? Or yes. why you would like to switch? Yeah, yeah, so as I mentioned, ECS gives you only a scaling capability, basically, right? And mm -hmm. that's it. But uh, you have to take care of all the rest. So for instance, configuration management, service discovery, and uh, so on. So with the ECS, basically, you will have to do something extra, like, for instance, deploying and managing console in order to have the full capability that Kubernetes gives you out of uh, the box and totally for mm -hmm. free. Uh, yes, but I mean that I already have working uh, solution with uh, ECS. Mm -hmm. It uh, contains uh, ECS uh, clusters, uh, services, uh, tasks, and uh, task definitions. Mm -hmm. And is there a, a simple uh, way to convert entire configuration to uh, Kubernetes? Mm, sorry, I'm not quite following. Um. You have working as a solution for ECS, right? Yes. Yeah, for, for the jobs. And how, for instance, you are, uh, I don't know, um, managing your versions and how you are, for instance, grabbing the, the configs from there? Mm -hmm. I use uh, AWS uh, tools for that, yeah. Pre precisely. So this is additional thing that you have to take care of, right? And with the Kubernetes, you have coherent approach for everything, right? Because this is uh, just complete up a product for such a, such a stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone have? Oh, there. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you have ever problem with order of uh, starting services. Uh, in one one of my previous projects, uh, we had several services. Uh, and because of security or let's say some some configuration services for uh, that provided configuration, uh, we had to have a, a order uh, in which they they need to start. How do you solve that using Kubernetes? Is there any building uh, mechanism for that? Uh, yes, uh, there is. So uh, Kubernetes has foreseen it, and basically for that purposes, you should use uh, something that is called stateful uh, set. So stateful set. Um, so stateful set is a um, service that should keep the state, right? Because microservices are stateless. But if you want to have, for instance, a database that is deployed in the Kubernetes, you have to have a stateful set. And first of all, you can define their uh, state. You can also define their order of the uh, deployment. So thanks to that, if you have any you know, dependencies between them, then you can uh, embrace it. Uh, 
I have a question about network because uh, you showed us that you know the services just came up and that they works just fine. And uh, what's you know under the hood? Because if you run through the Docker network, your network is pretty slow, like two times, I, mm -hmm. I guess. And what's in here? You, you know, maybe. Um, so um, that basically uh, it depends where you have your Docker registry, right? Because if it's I don't know whether I am ever following you uh, also here, but. I'm asking, you know, uh, about the network between the containers. Like, mm -hmm. if you if you use Docker and you link the containers together, you use Docker proxy, which mm -hmm. is pretty slow. Uh -huh. But you can use the host network. But here you have, dip, the, you know, multiple hosts. So how how does it work? Uh, how how is it connected? Like, you can, you know, uh, call from one application another application, mm -hmm. and th this goes through some through some network. But uh, what what is used? you know, under the hood, do you know maybe? Um, so uh, Kubernetes has uh, its own uh, DNS, uh, so this is the whole virtual uh, network, right? So uh, because of that, uh, you have this auto-discovery uh, auto feature that I mentioned um, b before, and um, basically that, that, that's it, right? Or, or no? Okay. okay, maybe, maybe, that's it. Okay. Okay, who wants to ask more? Okay, then I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Big applause.